Beyond the Wrench with Jay Ganinen from Wrenchway. Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen and I am your host. This week's episode, we're focusing on credit card chargebacks and really why it's relevant to shops all across the country is just understanding it in a little bit more uh, depth and really being able to maybe put together a strategy to, to help yourself get around it, maybe even just identify people that you can ask questions to at times it can be kind of a lonely place if you get that and very frustrating, especially if it's something for work that you've done and, and somebody uh, contests something, you know, in running a shop, there's a lot of opportunities for something like this to happen. So just overall being aware of it, Tyler Catry joined us and it really had a lot of really, really good insight into uh, how to how to go about it when you run into that situation. It is a it is a frustrating uh, thing to happen. I think most business owners have had it happen to them, and specifically shops. I, I think there's some really good information in this episode to help you out. And even for those te those technicians that are out there listening, I think listening to this and understanding some of the frustrations that go into this up front uh, might help you uh, better prepare you know a work order making sure that you have uh, all of your things documented right all of the work documented uh, because it really does uh, come into play a factor when something like this happens but before we get to the podcast i did want to announce our winner of the weekly higher or lower game and that was Tyler Mefford with a high score of 43. With that, Tyler wins a $100 Amazon gift card. And our sponsor for uh, last week's game is Truck Country and Stoops Freightliner. Uh, Truck Country and Stoops Freightliner Quality tra Trailer is one of the largest Freightliner dealership groups in the U.S. today, serving customers at locations in Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Wisconsin. For 60 years, trucks, uh, Truck Country and Stoops has offered new and used medium and heavy duty trucks, expert service, and extensive parts inventory and convenient financing options. Learn more at truckcountry.com. Uh, Truck Country is a, a great partner of ours, a, uh, a client of ours, and, uh, and really just uh, really good people. I say that with a lot of our, our uh, sponsors of the higher lower game, uh, and it's no exception in this case. Just really, really good people, a really, really good company. And so if you get a chance, go out and check out truckcountry.com. As for the Queen of Hearts pot, uh, Tyler unfortunately did not turn over the Queen of Hearts and that pot has increased to $3,400. Uh, if you want a shot at that $3,400, make sure you go out to the Wrenchway app and play the challenges, uh, earn points, play the games, and uh, get your shot at that $3,400 of cold hard cash. All right, now as for this week's episode, enjoy Tyler. He's a great person and uh, has just a, an extensive amount of knowledge on credit card processing in general. We dive into it in the podcast and I hope you enjoy it. All right, on this week's episode, I'm uh, excited to have Tyler Catry join me and talk about all things credit cards and credit card chargebacks. I think for a lot of businesses out there, this is a major frustration point and something that uh, I think there's some things that you can do to uh, work around it or be better at it. And Tyler is an absolute expert at this. So uh, excited to have you on the show. How are you doing, Tyler? I'm doing well and uh, excited to be here. I appreciate being asked on, Jay. So uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yes. And so Tyler's a, a, a part of one of our great partners, which is Wind River Financial, uh, really a big backer of Wrenchway. And uh, we love what what you guys do in terms of how you service your clients. And uh, just uh, you set an example for a lot of other businesses that we try to follow and, and really try to incorporate some of your best practices into what we do. So we'll have a show on that at some point down the road. But before we get kicked off, uh, why don't we start with what you do at Wind River Financial? What uh, What is your role there? Yeah, so uh, currently I'm the president of Wind River Financial. Um, just kind of stepped into that leadership role a few months back. Prior to that, I was the CFO here. So I am a professional nerd by training. Um, 
I am a number cruncher through and through. I'm trying to shed those stripes a little bit, but um, I probably never will completely. So, you know, being in my current role, I'd say, you know, largely responsible for just general oversight of the business and leadership and strategy. Um, it's, it's a welcome challenge and it's, it's exciting. Have you always been in the finance space uh, since college? I mean, have you came out of college and went directly into that? Yeah, I've been uh, I've been a number cruncher all my life uh, after college and even kind of before then. So um, I worked in uh, in a, my small town bank in high school, um, and then afterwards started working as accountant in health insurance of all industries. I uh, spent a good deal of time there, uh, working my way up, and then controller roles, and obviously the CFO here at Wind River, and and now that has brought me to uh, my current position as president. Well, congratulations on that. Very well deserved. And uh, I know Wind River's in good hands right now. You you do a ph phenomenal job in all aspects of business. And um, I, I think uh, think you're doing a heck of a job there too. Well, thanks, Dre. I appreciate it. And I'd say likewise. Thank you. All right. So we're going to dive into some kind of uh, some stuff that is really important for businesses. And to me, you know, prior to getting on the podcast, we talked about this. I think this is relevant to any business, uh, even to maybe technicians out there to understand some of the backside of what goes on. And uh, one of those major, major frustrations that I think a lot of businesses have is uh, credit card chargebacks, right? So it's something where you go out and you see maybe somebody disputed a charge or uh, maybe there was a misunderstanding on a refund or something like that, and you get a charge back for something that you've already refunded. Uh, it, it's it's something that I think is almost like a this mystical world that a lot of people don't understand and and maybe don't take the time to question because it they might see it on their statement and just kind of all right, there's not much I can do about it and move on. What is a, a common frustration with the chargebacks that you see, or uh, maybe a better way of asking that is, is any of this preventable? <laughs> uh, the, the frustration really kind of starts and stops with what is this and why do I have to deal with this? I mean, as business owners or anybody responsible in finance departments to, for kind of handling this process, um, it's just a tedious one. And like you said, there's a lot of things kind of behind the curtains, behind the scenes that make it that way. A lot of that is by design. I mean, if uh, I guess you kind of step all the way back, and, and why can some people? Why, why can this frust or why can this process be so frustrating um, from a merchant or a business owner's point of view? And that's really because the process is set up and designed to uh, favor us as cardholders and, con and consumers. So, you know, on the one hand, that's a very good thing for all of us that you know purchase with our credit and debit cards. As a business owner, when we get on the other side of a chargeback or a dispute, that's where it gets to be obviously much more frustrating. Um, are there things that we can do to stop that or reduce those as business owners? Absolutely. Um, that's not going to ease the frustration when they do occur. I think the thing to try to keep in mind and one thing that we tell our clients is, you know, despite how frustrating it might feel like when you provide a service, and then have to some have someone come back and question that, or you know say they didn't uh, didn't like what they received, or um, didn't get a refund like that. Um, the thing to try to keep in mind is it's always still a very small part of your overall sales, you know, and it's and it's set up to be that way actually by our the card brands. So like Visa and Mastercard, you know, they they have a cap where they won't let you as a business uh, owner exceed 1% of your total sales in disputes and chargebacks. So if you do that, you're going to fly up on their radar and they're be like, what's going on? So there's kind of rails and guardrails built in place as well. So if you're not hearing from, from us or your processor saying, hey, you've got an issue here, you know, it's not, it's not going to stop the frustration, but you're, you're also not at risk of, uh, you know, going, going as uh, a skew from the brands. Have, have you seen a business go over that 1%? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what typically happens when, when you, when you get to that level, um, and most often these are kind of retail businesses that have lots of daily transactions in and out. Um, but they'll come, the, the car brands will come back to you and say, Hey, we need a remediation plan. We need to understand why, you know, your disputes are so high. And, and, and again, when I say high, 
you know, it might be one and a half percent of total sales. Um, so overall that's low, but the networks and, and us as business owners also look at that and say, hey, we want every penny that we've earned, right? Yeah. We want to collect on that and a dispute is painful. But um, so when it does happen, the brands will come in and say, hey, why is this happening? Look to understand how can we stop this from continuing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's rare when that happens, um, but occasionally it does. What What's the risk? Like if, if a credit card company looks into it and they say, okay, maybe they don't have the best uh, business practices and it's, you know, a lot of those chargebacks are because maybe it's not a great business and they see that, are they at risk of getting their ability to actually run credit cards pulled from them? Absolutely. That's the, that's the ultimate stick, if you will. Um, now it takes a little while to get there, right? So typically if you get, if you bump over the threshold, you know, you'll have kind of a three month window to prepare a plan. Then you'll have, you know, three months to execute on that plan, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not uh, a snap your fingers, but ultimately if you can't fall in line, um, yeah, you're at risk of losing your ability to accept credit card payments. And how much does that vary like percentage wise? And you don't have to give me exact percentages, but in that retail environment versus maybe a service-based business versus, you know, I, I don't know what other, it, it, name name your business. I mean, I, like you said, retail is probably, that's got to be the number one. Uh, but are there any others that have that, you know, like maybe a, a lot of our, our customers are shops, right? So when you yeah. look at a shop and really a service focused type of business, and, it, and maybe not even necessarily just a service business, but, um, you know, are, are they falling in that range? I mean, are they typically going up to that 1% or are they down more like two tenths of a percent or something like that? Yeah. I mean, from, from a, from a shop owner's perspective, they're far, far less. Yeah. And really the key driver on that is what we call in our industry card present transactions versus card not present transactions. So what that really means is that when you're accepting that card payment, is someone physically in front of you, you know, entering their, their uh, card, um, whether they're tapping it on your device or they're swiping it or they're um, dipping it that, uh, for the little chip cards, et cetera. Yep. When you're doing that, that lessens your chargeback risk I mean, tremendously. Where we see those higher volumes and higher percentages of overall sales is where we see a lot of our clients that have e-commerce or they're taking a lot of orders over the phone where that card isn't present. That, that tends to push up that percentage of chargebacks. Okay, that makes sense. And so I, I wanna kind of take that the next step then is as a business owner or a manager, when you're seeing that come across and you, you're feeling that frustration because you're getting a chargeback and you're irritated because you feel like you delivered on what you said you were going to deliver, uh, what do you do? Like what's, what's a good action? I think when I look at it, I'll go through and, you know, you'll, you'll challenge it or, you know, not that we don't have it happen very often. So it's hard for me to kind of really pinpoint that. I do know if we do get one, it's super, super frustrating, but what is, what is kind of the correct process in which you, you tackle this? Uh, you know, you get that initial feeling like kind of gut feeling, but where do you go from there? Sure. So my advice would be for the, the first thing that you can do when one of these things happens is if you're able to contact the customer. So if you have uh, that information, you know, if, if, you know, if it's my shop and I got a chargeback coming in from Bob, I can call Bob up and say, hey, what's going on? And, and try, to, try to work that out. Um, what should happen when a chargeback is actually issued, the, the company, whether that's, that's Visa or the bank that they're working with, they should be telling Bob in this example, hey, make sure you're talking to Jay try to work this out between yourselves before you go this route with a dispute or chargeback. Um, but I still encourage all of our clients to go that route and contact the customer first and try to talk to them and understand what exactly is going on if they have that information. Yeah. If they don't, then it's really kind of about, you know, and this is, this is the nerd in me coming out. It's about gathering the paperwork. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it hurts me a little to even have to say that, but <laughs> It's, it's all about what can you document to prove that a service was provided or a refund was granted or, or whatever, what have you. 
and be able to show that to the card brands. And that's really what the next step is. Now there, there are timeframes involved with that. So it's not like you have to drop everything and, and get that done right away. I think typically you have anywhere from 20 to 30 days to respond. Um, but really that's kind of the next step is starting to get all that in line, understanding what the transaction was, the product, all of the different kind of, uh, again, paperwork, if you will, to support why that chargeback shouldn't be uh, awarded back to the cardholder. Do you, uh, I, I love the advice of reaching out to the customer first, because I do think it's, you know, just a good business practice, right? Of reaching out and making sure that you're on the same page. Uh, clearly you weren't if there's a charge back at, at some level, but uh, say, it, it, this is something that I've run across before is that somebody maybe didn't necessarily mean to, to charge back. Is that really a thing like where, where people are like, I, I, I don't know how that happened. Uh, it happened, but I don't know how it happened. It, that, that is a thing. Um, I would say it's rare, but I, I would offer this as an analog. Think of it when, and again, me, my nerd coming up. So when I'm <laughs> reviewing my credit card statement every month, um, I might see something on there and say, geez, what the heck is that? And maybe I don't talk to my wife and I figured, you know, that can't be right. <laughs> um, and, and similarly, she, she'll be doing the same thing, right? Another $500 charge to Cabela's, what could possibly be? <laughs> and, you know, in that instance where it's kind of, you're not entirely sure what it is, you know, sometimes those things happen um, and, you know, a, a dispute gets filed without the, the party really understanding what is at play. The other thing that we see too is depending on who you're working with as your kind of merchant service, or your payments provider, sometimes can affect what shows up on your credit card statement. So it's not clear in all instances. Like if they're going to Jay's shop, it might not say Jay's shop. It might say um, uh, PayPal or Stripe or, you know, and then JG or JS or something afterwards. And it might not be clear that you know, what did I actually buy? So in that particular case, or in those cases, that's when we can kind of see these uh, mistaken disputes. I, for one, can 100% attest to that, of getting that on your statement, not knowing what it is, and then finding out that what my wife charged something after the fact and not having any idea what it was, and then having a discussion and then, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. But uh, yeah. like jumping to conclusions right off the bat, I am terrible at that. <laughs> <laughs> Not alone, it happens, right? I mean, we, we all kind of do that, um, especially when we're talking about our wallets, right? So it's something that we're paying for and that's why we keep mindful eye on that stuff. So do you, like when, when you get into this scenario and you've got the charge back, you've reached out to the customer, and there's there's a, a, maybe a, a clear dispute, right? Like it's it's a he said versus she said type of scenario. You've got your documentation on what was signed off on, and then the customer is still possibly arguing it or saying that they didn't get the product as it was intended or something like that. What goes into that kind of decision making from a credit card processor standpoint of, of uh, or the, the credit card company's uh, standpoint in how you resolve that? That sounds miserable. That sounds worse than being like an airline attendant. Like that, that, <laughs> that sounds like the worst job in the world. Yeah, um, and it can be, but it's made simpler by the credit card's design to default to the cardholder or to the customer. Right. So, yeah, no one no one likes the kind of arbitration process or the dispute process. It's painful for everybody involved. Um, but when it happens, and you're kind of working through it. What I can say for certain is that you stand the best shot if it's a card present transaction. So, I mean, that because in almost by design, that means your customer is standing right, right in front of you, right? You, you, you're having this interaction where there's an exchange of goods and services and a payment, and you can kind of go back to that and say, yes, we had this transaction. Um, and, you know, if somebody comes back after the fact and says they want a refund or wasn't, things weren't as designed, well, then you, it's reasonable to expect them to come back into the, to the, the establishment, return their product, et cetera. If it's e-commerce or it's over the phone or that card isn't there, um, it's really going to be a tough road to hoe 
to get a successful chargeback because there's just there's just so it's so hard to prove um, and give additional evidence that something was delivered or that the person you know on the other side of the on the other side of the screen or the internet was the one that's actually transacting it right so um, that's that's really difficult because I mean obviously if COVID has done anything it's it's exacerbated the speed of the transition to e-commerce to online shopping to you name it right uh, people not going in to physical establishments, right? Um, so we see that at the same time for those that are in industries or businesses that are uh, kind of more likely to get these chargeback type events, that's really exasperated their pain on the chargeback front. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, with the industry that we're talking about susceptible to a lot of that. Um, so that's good. But once you kind of in that realm, it's, it's really hard to to have a successful dispute as a business owner or merchant. Now, you, the way that you said it, it kind of if there's a tie that it's like baseball. Like if there's a if there's a tie, the tie goes to the runner, right? It, it is kind of that way with the consumer. They're going to default to the consumer at the end of the day. I would say absolutely, and I would actually go a step further and say I don't. I'm not a gambler, but Vegas puts out lines on all the games, right? So I'd say. If it's you know the, the Packers against the Bears and the line is seven points, it's kind of the same way in that you know the, the customer has that additional seven points. Got so it. it's it's not even 50-50. You really have to uh, overcome quite a lot in order to be successful, and that's where that card present or that physical kind of exchange pays the most dividends in terms of getting successfully you know combating chargebacks because there's so much evidence there of a transaction taking place in exchange of goods. So t talk to me about how important documentation and process is when you're taking payment from every customer, because I'm assuming, you know, if, if that's your ammo to win and you're a business, but you don't do a good job documenting everything or you don't have the right things signed off on, that makes it awfully hard to win uh, in a dispute scenario, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, when it comes to documenting, a lot of these things are just common sense. And I would, I would bet commonplace in a lot of businesses, right? You have inventory or inventory tracking and numbers, whether it's through an ERP system or, you know, even spreadsheets, right? right. Um, understanding what's your inventory, keeping records of your accounting sales. I mean, these things are, are, are typical, right? So as long as you're doing those things, you're already a, a good way uh, in, in protecting yourself and having the, the necessary paperwork. In if your business is one where you have what I would call kind of a, a unique return policy, um, so you know I, I, it's hard for me to imagine, but let's just say you know on the spectrum from all sales are final to you've got 30 days to return and you have to do these 10 things in order to have a successful return. When you get super nuanced and super complicated in your return policy. That's where the additional documentation of making it crystal clear that your customer knows what they're kind of signing up for. And it, this will probably sound ridiculous, but you know, if you have one of those policies, what the card brands will do is they'll look for you to prove that your customer understood all of those unique policies and they can attest or acknowledge and, or initial that they said, yeah, I've got 30 days, but it's gotta do X, Y, Z, and then I've gotta do A, B, C, all of that stuff. So. That's the additional level of documentation. Um, if you want to go kind of that super uh, restrictive or nuanced return policy, not many, not many customers or businesses do that. Some do because they get frustrated to a point where, hey, you know, <laughs> they uh, they don't want it. No one wants to make it easy for people to return things. But right. the more complicated it gets, then the clearer you have to be to the customer that they understand and can acknowledge that they know what they're buying and the return policy that they're quote unquote signing up for. Is, is there a threshold where it's not even worth disputing? Like, so say if you, and this, it doesn't directly apply to maybe our audience, but say if you were sell, selling like a subscription base that was 10 bucks a month or something like that, and there was no annual commitment or anything like that. And you you look at the time spent from a, uh, administrative aspect of lining up your documents and lining up everything, yeah. you know, a, a, a hourly salary to me would out far outweigh like what the the actual value in that chargeback would be. 
So I'm curious just to see if you if you run across that or if there's anything that like, you know, there's a time and period where maybe you just don't even dispute it. I think there absolutely is that time. Um, I think that's different for every business owner in terms of, you know, what's most, what amount is meaningful to them. Um, so I, it's hard for me to put a, a specific number to it, but sure. I would also say that the, let me go back to kind of what I've said before, put some numbers to it. Yeah. You know, if, if it's a car present transaction that's being disputed and you've got the, the documentation in place, you're probably 75% likely that you're going to win. You know, if you can prove that, Hey, this is all legit. If it's a card, not present transaction, you're probably looking at 5% or less. I mean, it's that high of a hill to climb. Wow. So if you're getting a dispute, that's card, not present, you know, keep that into your, do put that into your calculus when you're determining how much time you really want to spend fighting it. Um, you know, if it's a $10 one or a $10,000 one, you know, you have to consider that. Um, and that gets into, you know, that gets into when you have those types of transactions, being, knowing your customer really, really well, right? Yeah. Because if, um, again, if I'm coming to your shop, Jay, and I, and I, I typically buy $100 items. And then one time I, I asked for a $10,000 item and I'm just calling in with my credit card. If you know it's me, you might know, yes, Tyler's good for it. And he needs this for this part for whatever project I may be working on. Um, but if someone else that you don't know calls in and you normally sell 10 or a hundred dollar items and they want $10,000 worth of materials, that's where you have to be really, really careful. Most businesses will be like, yeah, I got to, I'm going to make a $10,000 sale. Right. You have to be really careful because you could send all of that material out and we see this happen. You send those goods out, then, you know, a week later, a chargeback comes in saying, you know, it was a fraudulent transaction. So now you're out your inventory and you didn't make any of that money. So knowing your customer, very, very important, um, especially if you're going to be taking cards, not present. Um, so I'm sorry if I went a little bit off. No, that, that that's incredibly scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, really, it really is, right? And, and again, we see this all the time. And, you know, it's as a business owner, again, it's hard to not get excited when you get, I can make a big, big sale, but I need to take this card and I haven't seen this person. And this, this still happens all the time, right? We still, you know, card not present transaction, e-commerce, people buy big things online. So it's, it's not something that is scary in and of itself, but it, get, it comes down to, you know, the size of your business and making sure compared to what you normally sell, does this make sense? Do I, do I feel comfortable in knowing this person or knowing this customer to where I'm willing to send out my goods and, you know, assume that I'm going to be paid in full for those and not disputed later on. So how do you, I'm assuming there's probably some level of fraud that does actually happen, right? Where they, they, you know, somebody gets a, a transmission job done or something and it's, you know, several thousand dollars mm -hmm. and you take that card in good faith and then somebody charges it back. Uh, is Give me an idea, like how often does that happen? I mean, is it an everyday occurrence across America or is it more sporadic? Is it, you know, what, how, how consistent is it? Oh, it's every day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, fraud as a kind of chargeback reason, um, is, is the top dog that we see all the time. Now it's a lot harder to claim that when you're in person, right? Like if I'm coming in for that transmission job, um, it's hard to say that that was a fraudulent transaction. Now, again, if, if I'm not there or I'm calling it in, or there's some other service that I'm paying for online then yeah, it's much easier. And, and when we see the combination of card not present and fraud as the reason, that's where that 5% that likelihood shrinks to one or less really, really quickly because it's just so, it, it's next to impossible to prove. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, the, the only time that I can think of, and I'm sure there are others, but just to give an example of you know, one time where I've seen a, a merchant successfully uh, combat that was you know, a recurring a recurring transaction, right? So this, this 
business had a client that bought, let's just say a hundred dollars worth of stuff every month online, bing, bang, boom. Um, and then one month they bought something and they claimed it was fraud, but it was the same card number that had bought all the stuff before. In that instance, the merchant was able to say, Hey, the same card has been buying me for months and months and months. It, it, it's not fraud. Um, they can't, they, they can't prove that it is because like I said, we've got a history of them, those purchases coming through. That's one example when I can think of a card not present, uh, fraud chargeback, if you will, was actually upheld in favor of the merchant. But like I said, if, if I see that combination come through, it's, it's hard to say it, but it's going to be a next to impossible road, uh, to make that happen for the business. Man, there's just so many landmines of ways that you can screw this up, aren't there? The, there, there isn't. There, there is. I mean, there isn't. There isn't because okay. again, at, at, at its core, is the system is designed to protect Tyler, it's protect Jay, all of us as individual consumers, right? So that's that's its its uh, its design, right? Right. Um, and when I when I call in and say, hey, I wasn't I wasn't there, or I didn't make this purchase it's it's going to be very unlikely that the car brand is going to say no tyler we don't believe you it's so much easier to say no we don't believe jay's shop or business xyz etc is that is there any variation by state with the rules on this or is it kind of across the board credit cards handle it the same um yeah it's the way visa mastercard amex all those guys handle it across the nation even the world um to a certain extent is pretty consistent where I would say you can see some variability by state is some of the, not necessarily dispute related, um, but some of the tangential stuff, like what you can have on your return policy. Can you have a return policy? You know, what is what has to be on that? Um, perhaps some timing for when you can ask for a refund. Like I said, they can, you know, you might want to have a all sales or final or 30 days, you know, maybe perhaps the state law of I don't know, Idaho says you have to allow 120 days for somebody to come back. That's kind of on the fringes, but generally state by state, um, you know, Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, we'll look at it regardless of where, where the location is. That's that's good to know. I, I honestly would have thought differently there. And it's, uh, it, you know, just based on regulation and how it varies from California to Florida uh, and knowing that, there's commonality there, I think does help people because there's so many times where when something happens, um, and especially if you're dealing uh, nationwide, maybe more so than a, a local uh, shop, that you do have some concern or maybe not even, not even concern, just worry that you don't know everything that goes into it and maybe not knowing that you're going to make the best educated decision if, if you don't know the rules. And so that's, that's really good information. I think that helps a lot. Yeah, no, I, I mean, there are plenty, <laughs> there are plenty of business laws and rules that apply uh, that are unique to each state that you, that you live or operate or work in. You know, we can take solace that the chargeback and dispute mechanism is pretty similar regardless of what state, if not identical. So with, with your clients, how much goes into educating them about chargebacks? Is it more, is there anything proactively a business can do or is it more so if you get a chargeback, then you're kind of learning while you're putting the tires going on the, on the car going down the road, you know, is it, is it more just learning as you do it or are there proactive ways that you can be more educated about it? Um, Typically, what we try to do is we try to kind of give everybody that, that one-on-one coming in. Now, again, it's, well, I shouldn't say again, you know, if you're new to accepting credit card payments, um, it's easy to pretend and perhaps be naive that I'll never have a chargeback. I'll never have a dispute. That will never, ever happen to me, um, but it will. So yeah. what we try to do with our clients is we try to kind of go through that one-on-one with them at the onset at boarding. So there's an understanding of uh, what could happen here and, and kind of some good practices to employ to avoid it or minimize it as best possible. Um, but in general, you know, the best, unfortunately, the best way to learn is once you have to go through the process. Um, and then you kind of see how, how, Visa, MasterCard, et cetera, look at these things, how your processor partner looks at these things. Cause you know, how Wind River does it might be different than, 
some other processor that you're working with or, you know, any other uh, processor that's out there. So uh, there are individual nuances, but, um, you know, the best, you know, the, the best way to combat that is just to be prepared as, as with much of anything, right? So to kind of sidestep from the dispute side to just general credit card processing, when you're getting somebody set up to take credit cards and and being, you know, for those shops that are out there that uh, maybe have traditionally taken credit cards but really don't pay a lot of attention to anything, you know, maybe rates. And I know we had Carly on uh, probably about a year ago to talk more about the specifics of this part, but yeah. I, I do think when you're going into, you know, in the environment that we're in today where I feel like credit cards are far more prevalent than they were maybe 20 years ago, uh, just in terms of people feeling safe using them. I know my brother's a financial advisor and uh, he scared the hell out of me once when he talked about uh, uh, the fraud that happens with using debit cards or with using, you know, they had, they had somebody come in and talk about all all of that. Yeah. And it was frightening <laughs> to, to me. But w when you're setting up a business, it does feel like there's a lot of maybe intricacies in credit card processing that maybe we don't fully grasp or even take the time to understand. And I feel like disputes kind of fall into that into that realm where, you know, even for myself, when I started a, a business, it's not something that I really paid a whole lot of attention to. And I was totally guilty of being like, yeah, we're never gonna have any problems like that, you know? And it, it just, in general business, it feels like that happens. You're going to have a misunderstanding with somebody at some point or something's going to come up. And, um, you know, I, 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 I look back and I'm like, gosh, I don't know what I would have done differently to, to start things off. Maybe pay a little bit more attention to the things that smart people are trying to tell me, or I, I don't know what, what to do there. It's, and I would say it's really tough. Um, if you're, if you're starting a, a business or you're, it's your first time accepting payments or whatever, you've got a million things going through your head. And knowing the intricacies or nuances of accepting credit cards is probably the last thing on your mind, right? <laughs> you want to make sales. You want to have a successful business. Knowing what PCI is or um, the, the nuances of interchange and how those fees can kind of um, make you pay more or less depending on the card that's presented. I mean... I'm the president of a, of a credit card processor and I don't even like talking about all those things all the time. Right? <laughs> I know they're difficult. So it's, uh, it's totally understandable. Um, and it's really hard to engage at first when you're kind of getting into it. What I'd say is, you know, because of that, I, I would, not, I would never try to tell a business owner how they should, how they should feel or how much they should invest their time, you know, regarding payments or their business in total. But what I would say then is, that's why I think it's really important that you have a trusted relationship with whoever you select as your processor, that you feel good about who you're working with, and that, you know, when something in inevitably does happen, there's somebody you can talk to and will help guide you through the process. Um, so you don't have to know it all up front, but you're working with somebody that you know does know it all. Yeah. And they'll be there when you need them to help you out. Well, um, that, that would be my advice. And I totally agree. I, I know a lot of you at Wind River and having somebody that you, you know, know, like, and trust to hold your hand through the process is, you know, not only just in disputes, but in getting this set up and getting it off the ground and making sure that you're being charged fairly. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's something that a lot of places miss out on. And, you know, maybe that credit card processor is just, there to take, you know, they're not there to serve you. Like they're there to uh, have something in place where, you know, they're, they're gonna help you charge cards, but they're not gonna do the other stuff that to help you truly understand what it is that you are getting charged for or uh, knowing, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I think it's like any professional service, right? If, if you can hire somebody that's smart and can guide you through the process, you're miles ahead. Uh, if you, if you just kind of, I think a scenario a lot of people do is they just set something up and let it go and don't worry about it unless there's an issue. 
Yeah, no, I'm absolutely that, that that's in large part, I think human nature, right? I mean, there, there's a reason why on my credit card statement every month, there's this recurring Apple payment that I keep seeing. And it's because I don't do anything about it. Right. Um, I, you know, whether it's Apple TV or Netflix, right? Yes. I, I'm Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> it bothers me. I barely watch it. <laughs> like every month I see it come through. I'm like, Oh my god. Right. Goodness. Right. It's, it was convenient and it just keeps, it keeps rolling through. So yeah, I mean, I think at the onset, and again, I understand this as someone coming into it, you probably buy for convenience or you at least consider it, right? What's, what's the easiest thing that I can do at the onset to get up and running, but what you, what you kind of, the, the, what you don't get for that convenience is you're, you're most likely not getting the best rates. You're most likely not getting somebody who will be there to help you out when you have an issue with urgent or, or otherwise. Right. Um, and if you don't kind of pay attention to that at some point, you know, you're, you're going to be 12, 24, 36 months down the road and, and probably paid, you know, maybe 10,000 to a hundred thousand dollars more in your, in your costs and, and credit card fees than you ever wise ever otherwise would have. Um, and it's unfortunate. We see that happen. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, having somebody on, on your side and kind of looking out for you as a business and not just saying, Hey, my job is done now that they can accept payments. You can do that. And, and there's plenty of processors and our competitors that do, um, there are others where, yeah, we can help you get paid, but then we can also help optimize that system for you. Right. We really, I mean, and not, we, we view it as we want to kind of be, and I think every processor should want to be your kind of your outsourced payments department. Yeah. Right? Somebody you can turn to maximize your return, help you get paid and keep things running smooth. How in that kind of struck a chord with me, um, with like the random recurring payments that you have on your credit card from a personal standpoint. And that might not have been, that was something maybe I didn't fully understand when going into business for myself was that you multiply that when you have a business, right? Like you sign up for, I don't know, say Adobe and you work on a project and then you let that subscription go for another year before you really even are like, Hey, I, I don't actually use this at all. Uh, why am I paying for it? Uh, you know, it, it, I feel like that's such a practice that is undervalued in terms of just simply going through your credit card statement and not just doing it to make sure that everything's lined up in QuickBooks, but to actually look at the line items and say, okay, what do I really need that? Like, is that, you know, it, do, if I've got a Microsoft Microsoft subscription, but I've used Word once in the last two years because I use Google Docs all the time, is it worth that investment? And I almost feel like being able to look through that and then ask yourself questions is is a pretty key business principle in general. Yeah, it is, right? I mean, you want to be thoughtful and mindful about the things that you're spending your hard-earned, hard-earned money for, right? It's hard enough to make sales and then to, you know, have to give you know, two to 3% of it away back to somebody else, you know, that, that stings a little bit. Again, you know, <laughs> we're talking two to 3%, but you, you work hard for every penny that you make. And, and there are businesses out there that don't, don't have two or 3% margins, right? So you have to, you have to squeeze every penny that you can out. Now, I, I would say some, some approaches will be in, in what you'll see oftentimes in, in using our lexicon is to say bundled pricing, right? So I can pay it doesn't matter what it is. I can pay 3% on every sale that I take in. And at the end of the month, I, I see that 3%. What, what kind of takes that next level of critical thought is to say, well, uh, there's a lot of things and business owners don't necessarily know this unless you're familiar taking payments. There are thousands and thousands of interchange tables and fees that kind of get rolled and bundled up. Well, if I'm just paying a flat 3%, I would bet chances are that you could be paying anywhere. You could probably be paying close to two, three, two, four. So that's addition. That's you know sixty basis points or round up to a full percent that you probably could get a better deal on. But because of the convenience of getting set up and just having a flat three percent, you know you miss out on that. So, um, and then again, if if it's if if they're if they're like you or I and not not necessarily checking that that statement or bill as it's coming through every month, you kind of set it and forget it. And then that's how I said, you know, that's where you find yourself down the road wondering, geez, Louise, um, you talk to somebody who can say, I can get you at two, three. 
you go back and think, oh man, um, you left a lot of money on the table. I am 100% guilty of this, both in my personal life and my professional life. That's where it's a beautiful thing that my business partner is a CPA because he's the one that catches this stuff. Uh, but it is something that, you know, and I know we're, we're kind of getting off of the dispute piece, but I think this is really fascinating to me because I, I didn't know what questions to ask, right? And I think when you sign up with, you know, X big box company uh, to do your credit card processing, you don't really get that service element to it and you really don't even know what questions to ask. You're just fully trusting somebody that probably doesn't have your best interest in mind. They, they provide a convenience and provide a service that makes your life easier. So I think people look past that a little bit, but you know, what are, what are maybe some of those questions when that shop that's out there looking at their, their own credit card processing should be asking? I mean, are they, is it primarily fee driven? Is it, you know, uh, asking about what other pieces they get out of, you know, being a part of your, being a partner with you? Like how, do, how does somebody have an idea whether they've got a good uh, credit card processor or not? Yeah, that's a great question. I think if you're coming into it and you're shopping, I mean, our industry for the longest time and and it, it happens with any mature industry. So credit card processing, financial services. Um, at some point you get to the, the evolution where it's super price competitive, right? So of all the processors that are out there, fees and talking about fees and trying to way to drive them down, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's been out there for years now. So of course it's, it's, it's important to ask and understand that. Um, I don't think it's the most important, but to kind of tie that piece off, what, what we in the industry kind of talk about is what's called net effective rate. So what that really means, Jay, is when you sum up all of the different fees, whether somebody is going to charge you one, one rate and it's going to be, you know, 3% in total and 30 cents for every transaction, um, or someone who's going to come in and say, we're going to charge you a cost plus where you, whatever MasterCard and Visa charges us, we're going to charge you. We're getting a small piece at the top. When you add all those things up and kind of divide that by your total sales, that's your net effective rate. So when you're shopping and you're thinking about comparing on price, if you're trying to do it, looking at each individual line item, you will drive yourself nutty. Um, <laughs> been there before. So you kind of have to roll it all up and say, at the end of the day, all of the fees in, I'm going to pay two, three with this guy. I'm going to pay two, five with that guy. Having that highest understanding, um, that's really what's going to provide you the best clarity when you're shopping on price. Um, I would advise against that. I, what I really think is you can't, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a professional nerd by training and number cruncher. So I'm not going to say that you don't pay any attention to it because obviously you do. Um, but I always think of, I want to buy... Because when something goes wrong, what, what confidence do I have in the ability of the, of the person to fix it? Um, you it's know, a good way to put it. If I don't have that confidence or if I'm staying across from one of my best customers and they want to buy something from me and I can't take their card, whether my terminal doesn't work or there's some issue or that's when it's kind of on you. Like I try to put myself in that position. If my best customer came in with his biggest order ever and I couldn't take that transaction, what would I do? Mm -hmm. and, and who am I most confident in that's gonna be able to solve that for me? And that's why I kind of use that as my rubric and knowing that you have a trusted partner uh, and someone you can call who's gonna be there and, and kind of move heaven and earth to the extent that it's possible to help you be successful in that regard. Those are really the two big things that I think about. What about different types of tools? One thing we mentioned earlier in the podcast was fraud and how scary that is. And, you know, I, you know, I think it just drives some level of uncertainty or anxiety with any business owner, but are there tools or preventative measures that you can take to, to, you know, we talked about, you know, knowing the customer, that kind of thing, but you know, it, it's still a scary thing. Are there questions around fraud? Are there questions around maybe uh, what tools you can use to, to prevent fraud? Does that make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. There are tools out there. Um, a, a couple come to mind. One is, um, it's well, I, I, we've all seen it. I think it's called Recaptcha. But it, yeah, you know, when you're buying something online, you have a grid and you have to pick the pictures that have the bicycles in it, or you have to decode some kind of cryptic series of characters, right? Having those type of tools in place increases the, or kind of decreases kind of the automatic fraud, right? So if someone can just come onto your site and throw some digits out there and make a purchase, um, they have to go through that exercise. That takes care of a good deal. Um, another thing that we're seeing, it's been kind of a recent development in our industry is essentially insurance for car not present transactions. So what you can do is if you're really concerned about, you know, you have an e-commerce or you got a, a website that you like to do sales on and you're unhappy with the, the chargebacks that are coming through, there are services out there, they're expensive, um, but you can essentially buy insurance to say, I'm willing to forego X percent and then have this insurance company come in. And what they'll do is every transaction that goes through your website, They'll run it through their AI, their algorithms to say, you know, whether they believe it to be fraudulent or not. And if, if not, they'll let it process. And if they will, they'll reject it. And then what would happen is if they let a process or let a transaction come through and it's later disputed or found to be fraudulent, they are on the hook for paying that back. So those are kind of two tools I would, I would say that are out there right now that you can use to combat fraud. Um, you know, it, Stepping back, Jade, kind of saying just from a, a, a total hierarchy, I would say kind of, um, you know, with car not present being the most likely, obviously reducing that and get as many car present transactions as you possibly can. And then within the car present, if you're able to, those little chip, you know, uh, dip it in your machine, tap it on your machine. And if you can't do that, swiping is the last resort, right? So on the, on the, if I'm a business owner or I'm a, a nerd responsible for credit card processing or uh, credit card uh, payments, that's kind of the spectrum I'm thinking of. I want to get most of those things, uh, most of those payments card present with my uh, tap or dip and, you know, all else, you, your risk increases. But why? So why is that? Why is it that that the dip is more secure than a swipe? That is a super complicated question, <laughs> but, the, but, but it has an easy answer is that okay. there's some magic in that little, that little chip that's in there. And, and it, it, it's, it, at the end of the day, it's, it's encryption, right? Yeah. So that, that, that hides the 16 digit number. It kind of repackages and garbles it all up and send it and secures it. Uh, I'm sorry, sen securely transmits that through the processing system. Whereas if you're just swiping it on that little magnetic strip, that's far less secure um, and has just kind of less, yeah, less secure data on it. So yeah, your numbers are out there floating around then. And, and it, if somebody's going to hack you or something like that, you're, you're more exposed. Yes, it's it's easier to uh, attack that swipe than it is the little chip. See, that was the easiest explanation I've ever heard of that. And I, I you know, back when I worked in a shop. I would explain it to my employees that way. Well, I, I shouldn't say that way because the way that I explained it was just do it this way and no, <laughs> no, no, no explanation as to why. Uh, but hearing that that little sound bit there, I'm like, man, that I could take that and I could have plastered that everywhere and been able to explain people, uh, explain to people in a little bit more of a, I don't know, just a better way. Uh, like I did a terrible job of that when I was on the shop side. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that you're giving me a lot of leniency because essentially what I said is there's some magic in this chip. So <laughs> I, I, don't I don't pretend to be. Uh, I, I'm going to use that from now on though. There's some magic in that chip. Don't even yeah, think about yeah. it. That That's uh, but even just knowing that when you swipe it, the numbers are out there, you know, p potentially, uh, you're just putting yourself more at risk. And I think that, you know, from a consumer standpoint, for me, um, that that makes a heck of a lot of sense. So I, I appreciate you uh, cleaning that up uh, so that a simple person like me can understand that. <laughs> you bet. All right. So we're getting close to up on our hour here. Uh, one thing I've got to ask you about is 
that looks like a picture of Vince Lombardi behind you. Is that is that true? For those yeah. not not watching but listening, he's got a really nice picture of Vince Lombardi behind him. Yes, absolutely. So safe to inspiration every day. It is, and safe to assume a Packer fan. Yes, I was Wisconsin bred, born and raised, and I can't see myself leaving. We are uh, incredible homers here in Wisconsin. Like I, I feel like <laughs> like all of us. I'm wearing a Badger shirt today. Uh, yeah. Big basketball game tonight. So I, I, um, uh, yeah, we're we're all uh, incredibly uh, tainted in terms of our our home teams, our home affiliations. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I, I can't, I can't, uh, deny that. Um, it's, it, it makes, it makes the, uh, the, uh, the family reunions fun because there's always, you know, there's always the one guy or, or the girl that married out of staters and, you know, some random bear Vikings fan walks in, but yeah, uh, yeah. You know, we're, we're also good natured folks in Wisconsin. So we'll, we'll give them a hard time, but we'll, we'll let it slide. My father-in-law is a diehard Bears fan, so it uh, makes Thanksgiving really interesting uh, when we <laughs> when we get together. But no, thank you so much for joining uh, me today. I think this was incredibly educational. I know I learned a ton. I need to listen to this one back probably about twenty times so I can truly comprehend everything that we talked about. But you know, I, I think chargebacks are an awkward conversation or they're, you know, it's a level of frustration with people that are out there. And I think having some of the information that you were able to teach us today does help us maybe take some of the emotion out of it and really look at it from the standpoint of, okay, what, what do I have to do to best protect myself? And, and um, even just the, the general business practices of, you know, make sure you reach out to the customer first and have a conversation with them. You might be able to learn something about what you did that you could change for a future customer down the road. So uh, just a, an incredible amount of insight and and uh, I really appreciate you joining us and, and diving into that. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I appreciate you saying that. And um, yeah, it's it's one of those things, right? As a business owner, it's the, you don't like to see these things happen. Um, they're kind of a pain, but you can deal with them, move on and, and do your best to minimize them. And, and I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. So yeah. I, well, I, I think it's nice as I'm looking back on the podcast, I'm like, it's nice to know you're not alone as a business too, right? Like I think hearing that it happens to other businesses and that there's, you know, there's some level of just you know, it's it's part of doing business, and you you, you got to take the emotion out of it a little bit and really attack it from that business perspective. That's uh, that's something I'll take out of this because I think that was incredibly helpful. Great, I appreciate that. All right, well, thank you, Tyler. If uh, if people want to get in touch with you to learn more about Wind River Financial uh, or you, uh, where should they go? Um, your best bet is windriverfinancial.com. We've actually got our entire team out on the website. So if you need to get in contact with me or anybody on our team, it's all there for you. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, talking with clients and customers is uh, the best part of our day. It's certainly the best part of mine. So I, I'd encourage anybody and everybody to reach out. Love to talk to you. I would encourage that same exact thing. All of our shops that are out there listening, it is so important to have a relationship with your credit card processor and uh, Wind River is at the top of that list in terms of service and and really genuinely caring about you and, and looking at you as a person rather than just a business. So uh, please, please go out, check out windriverfinancial.com. Uh, great people, and I think your experience will be great as well. So thanks again, Tyler. Yeah, thank you, Jay.